radio play for today, Lovable Liars, is based on a very amusing story which will appear in next Sunday's issue of the American Weekly, the magazine distributed with all Hearst Sunday newspapers from coast to coast. Front page dramas are produced in the studios of the General Broadcasting Company. <laughs> Llewellyn Meath, despite the mildness of his name, is a fierce challenger of legend and hearsay. Night after night, he brings home huge volumes from the Hilldale Public Library and avidly reads the biographical and historical anecdotes in order that he may question their truthfulness. Tonight, as he and his wife sit in their living room, something causes Mr. Meath to look up from the ponderous tome he has balanced on his bony knees. Christina? Yes, Llewellyn? You used to be a school teacher, and you're pretty smart. Thank you, Llewellyn. Did you ever hear of a fellow named Diogenes? Certainly. He used to live in Greece. He did not. It says right here in this book he lived in a tub. An empty tub. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Llewellyn. Greece is a country, and that's where he lived. Well, that's a funny name for a country. They must have raised a lot of hogs there. Diogenes was not a hog. He was a philosopher. Heaven. Did they have trouble with radical foreigners in those days, too? Look, Ellen, what made you bring up Diogenes' name? This here, you always carried a lantern around with it. Silly. Why? There must have been sunlight then, same as there is now. What did he want to tie himself up for lugging a lantern around? It was a symbol. What a symbol? It was a lantern. In a symbol, I could understand his reason. He could plan it and keep people out of his way. You don't understand, Llewellyn. I mean, it was symbolic. Symbolic of his everlasting thirst for an honest man. It's a bet, and it ought to be easy. What's the bet, and what ought to be easy? It's a bet that I can find more liars than old Diogenes could find honest men. What are you talking about, Llewellyn? Diogenes took his lantern and went looking for an honest man. He was a philosopher. All right, I'm an American, and I'm going to take my automobile and go looking for liars. <laughs> Here we are in Montana. I hope you're satisfied. Now, Christina, according to what I've heard, everything grows bigger and better out west. So why shouldn't we come out west to look for bigger and better liars? What was the matter with that fisherman in Chicago who told you he caught a fish so big that when he got it into the boat, he grabbed an oar and he has rowing back to the dock? Christina, that man was just an amateur. Now, let's see. I'd like to find a doctor in this town who can qualify as a representative liar. Yeah, you see. Oh, uh, there's a doctor's office over there. Where? I don't see any doctor sign. H.M. Fisher. He's a doctor. Why, well, no such thing. He's an op, uh, op, uh, optometrist. That's an eye doctor. It is? Then he's just the man to see for story. He's got a good start. Calling himself one thing and being another. Here we are. Get out, Christina. That's oh, it. Now we'll just find out about this doctor business. Uh, hello, hello. Dr. Fisher? Yeah, yeah. Come in, please. My name is Llewellyn Meek, and this is my wife, Mrs. Meek. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, won't you sit down, please? Doctor, I'm interested in learning whether you've always been an eye doctor. Now, that's funny you should mention it, Mr. Meek. And no one has ever suspected I was one time something else again. I guess you mean you have always been an eye doctor. Yeah, that's it. I haven't. Would you mind telling me what you used to be? Yeah, in the old country, I was a civil engineer. I laid out oil roads. Fancy that, Christina. You used to lay out railroads. A visionary from the very start. Eh, hey, doctor? Excuse me. You must excuse my wife, doctor. She's educated. <laughs> Tell me something of the work you did as a civil engineer. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the old country, I specialized on curves. Curves? Christina? Yeah. I put in two of the most famous railroad curves in Europe. Uh oh. Won't you tell us about them? Yeah, well, the first curve is so sharp that the engineer from the locomotive can shake hands with the conductor on the rear platform of the caboose as the train goes around the curve. Him. Yeah, but that's not nothing, nothing compared with my last one. And what is that one like, Doctor? 
Well, that one is so sharp. <laughs> it's so sharp that when the train goes around it at night, <laughs> the headlight on the locomotive goes, it seems, right into the firebox. You don't say. He does, Christina. You know, I'll never forget the summer we built that railroad. By golly, it was the hottest summer I've ever seen. Well, back in Hilldale, that's our hometown. I've seen it so hot that we've had to water the trees to keep them from drying up. Water the trees? <laughs> well, by golly, you haven't seen anything yet. By that summer, it was so dry down in the river bed that the dogfish used to come up around our bunkhouse and park until we would go out and give him a drink. My, my. Fancy that. Doctor, you have a lot of grasshoppers out here, haven't you? We noticed them as we were driving along. Say, by golly, you don't think you've seen a lot of grasshoppers, do you? Why, yes, we thought we had, didn't we, Christian? Yeah. <laughs> well, listen to this. One year when I was a kid, they were so thick that when they were on the move, they darkened the sun. Only the men used to carry lanterns so they could do their noonday job. No. Goodness. My mother had planted some radish seeds, and in the rich soil, they used to grow pretty big. Well, the grasshoppers used to pour into them and eat the insides out. Then we would pick them up, and what do you think we used them for? Why, for dinner. No, by golly, for bird cake. No. Yes. And I'll never forget what happened to one fellow's tobacco crop. I suppose they chewed it all up. Yeah, but uh, that's not all. When the fellow came out to chase them away, there was the hopper sitting on the fence post, spitting the back of shoes at them. <laughs> Come, Christian. Hey, wait, 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 I'll tell you about this. <laughs> Where on earth do you suppose we are now? I haven't seen a signpost for miles. And I haven't found a single liar since we struck the state line. Oh, there's a man in that field. Let's ask him where South Park is. You, mister. Hey, me. Yes, you. Come here. Well, what can I do for you, sir? Oh, how do you, ma'am? How do you do? Well, look in for South Park. Can you tell us where it is? Well, you'll be right at it, stranger. This clearing? Yes. Why, there's nothing here but some cattle. Well, of course. What do you think this park is for? The chain for parking shuttles, eh? Parking? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes, of course. Fancy that, Christina. How quaint. They must have read about the president keeping sheep on the White House lawn. Well, we'd better be driving on, Willem. There's a wind rising. Yeah, but sure do blow around these parts. Why, in the old days, I camped for the night one time just back to the top of that butte over yonder. Right over there? Yep, right over there. Look, Christina, right over there. Hmm. Can't see that. Well, I lit me a little fire of buffalo chips to boil me some coffee and fry me a little bacon. Well, sir, the wind was a blowing and the fire caught in the buffalo grass and started to run down the side of the butte and across the prairie. How awful. <laughs> Did it burn all the houses? Is that why there aren't any around here? Oh, no, ma'am. There weren't any houses around here about to get burned up. But uh, it made it kind of hard for me, seeing as how my supper weren't cooked yet. Well, what you ever do? Well, I took out after the fire. Coffee pot in one hand and skillet of bacon in the other. And just as sure as there's plains in Kansas, <laughs> I chased that dang busted fire 15 miles before I got that bacon fried. <laughs> now, Christina, we're going to take a day off of the life. It's a nice, quiet stream. You sit down under that tree and rest. And read your magazine while I do a little fishing. All right, Llewellyn. I I'll sit down over here. We were seeing Nelly Moon. We were... Oh, uh, oh, Christina. Yes? Sorry to disturb you, dear, but where is that package of fish hooks? I thought I had them right here. Oh, they're right here. It's a good thing you aren't a fish, Llewellyn. Or they'd have hooked you. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yes, indeed. <laughs> You're quite right, my dear. Well, if you don't mind, I'll go back to my reading. Not at all, Christina. I don't mind at all. Go right ahead. We were seeing the we home. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, Christina. Well? Oh, yes, everything's well. That is almost. The funny thing, my dear, but I don't seem to be able to find my double-gauge wheel around. 
Oh, I didn't mean for you to come way over here just for that. Here's yeah, your real dwelling. Why, so it is, right there, all wrapped up. Can you imagine, Christina? I thought it was a hard-boiled egg in that package. Well, uh, I'm going down the river a little further. Llewellyn, if you went down to the bottom of it, it would be all right with me. <laughs> oh, you will have your little joke, sweetheart. Good afternoon. How are you, sir? They don't bite very good round here, do they? That's, however, a lad's got to know how to fish the cat fish, baby. And we've got lads around here that can catch anything. Fancy. Fancy, you plain. But speaking of that reminds me the time I was fishing with a friend of mine right over there. Right over there? Yes, sir. Right over there we caught so many fish we were sick of eating them. When a long one afternoon came, a couple of kids up and listened to the ripples down there. I told me, friend, I wish we'd bring our shotguns. One of them ducks would go well for supper. So what do you suppose me, friend, did? Went home for the shotgun, came back and shot one of the ducks. He had it for supper. No, sir, we did nothing of the sort now. But he snuck down behind one of the bushes yonder, cast out a ginger quill fly, and slaughtered it down to where them ducks were feeding. One of them gobbled it like a June bug, and me friend gave him the hook. You mean he caught him on the line? He did that. The team gave a quack and went up in the air. Then you should have seen me friend play The duck did a couple of barrel rolls and nose dived into the river again. But my friend proved he was a fisherman by working the team close enough to scoop him up with the land and net as he went by. And we had duck for supper sure enough. Hey, where are you going? Where's the minute I told you? Christina, come quick. Let's get away from this place as fast as we can. What's the matter, Llewellyn? I've heard enough tall stories to last me the rest of my life. I've already got old Diogenes beat four ways for Sunday. And I don't believe there's anybody could tell me a bigger whopper than I've already heard. Oh, excuse me, boss, but uh, could you lend, lend me a piece of that uh, bait? Yeah, take all my bait. I don't want it. Oh, thanks, boss. I sure wishes I had all this bait when I was ice fishing last winter. Boy, I had an awful time getting any bait, and that's a fact, too. What did you do? Well, I found out that the only bait around there was invisible ice worms. Invisible ice worms? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, Llewellyn, listen to this. I heard all there is to hear. Come here. I bet you've never heard of using invisible ice worms for bait. Invisible ice worms? Nonsense. You couldn't see them to you. No, sir, boss. You couldn't see them, but you sure could hear them. <laughs> well, what could you do about that? Well, I've got me an idea, see? I filled up a dish pan with red dye and mixed some sugar into it. I suppose the worms ate it up and you saw them. Yeah, the boss says, yes, what? The ice worms ate up all of that red dye. Boss, <laughs> I saw them plain as day against the ice. But they were so fast that I couldn't catch them. What did you do? Well, uh, the next night, I set the dish pan out for whiskey. Well, that made the ice worms drunk, and I was able to catch me quite a few, and I used them for bait. Where's the cat? Everything that them worms took a fancy to. Get in that car, Christina. Let's go home. And long about the middle of the afternoon, one of those darn worms caught me a polar bass. <laughs> so I quit. Hmm. So do I. <laughs> You should read the amusing details of a modern Diogenes trip looking for lovable liars. We'll see you next Sunday's issue of the American Weekly, the magazine distributed with all her Sunday newspapers from coast to coast. This amusing story will appear under the title, Some Tall Stories They Told Him. This is Wentworth announcing and turning the microphone over to your own announcer.